Hello, and you're listening to Your Majesty's Secret Podcast. I like my podcast, Shaken, Not Stirred, only on the Four Eyed Radio Network. If you'd like to check out more shows, go to foureyedradio.com. This Four Eyed Radio production is brought to you by America Joy Print Shop. All your printing needs taken care of in one convenient place. Visit AmericaJoy.com for business cards, flyers, banners, decals, car wraps, and more. Visit AmericaJoy.com. Bond. James Bond. Shaken, not stirred. Utter one more syllable and I'll have you killed. I thought Christmas only comes once a year. For your eyes only, darling. I never joke about my web 007. For England, James? Come in, Univex. James Bond here. Am I going to have a problem with you, Bond? Allow me to introduce myself. You're that secret agent! That English secret agent from England! You're cleverer than you look. Mm, still better than looking cleverer than you are. My God, what's Bond doing? I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. 007 reporting for duty. Hello, the name's Berkeley, Ziggy Berkeley, from Cinema on the Rocks. And with me is Eric Dewey, from Socially Awkward Studios, Science and Beer, and many other fine shows on the Fern. And you are listening to Her Majesty's Secret Podcast, where we discuss bondage. (laughs) James Bondage. All things 007. And for this episode, now that we have gone through our rundown of all of the James Bond movies thus far, we're going to be going a little bit further into the character of James Bond. And for this show, we're going to be asking, who is James Bond? What are the essential things that make up the character of James Bond in our own minds? What is what is necessary to make the ideal James Bond? And I don't think the answers are as cut and dried as they may first seem when you ask the question. And over the course of this discussion, we will also be going through our list of who we think best exemplifies our ideal of James Bond. So amongst the actors who have played him in the movies, plus throwing in the character written by Ian Fleming, we'll be ranking them from number seven to number one. Uh, We'll be talking about them in that ranking as far as how they best exemplify our ideal for Bond. But as we do so, we'll also note which are our actual favorites to watch just as fans. Of course. All right, so we should probably just jump right into this then, since we're not talking about any specific movies. We're really talking about all, all the movies. Um, so, so all the bondage, (laughs) lots of bondage. Yeah. So, who is James Bond? Obviously, it's a well. Yeah, you get the basics. He's a British secret agent, so he's a spy. You know, thrillers and spy action. He's got to be able to to do all that, right? So that you got the basic right there. Uh, But what else? Well, one thing that I think we can definitely agree on, and this doesn't count in our list, even though this technically was an official bond, Mm -hmm. he is not card sense Jimmy Bond. (laughs) Uh, He is definitely not Barry Nelson from the Climax episode. (laughs) uh, Yes. Um, No, the only thing that I can really say was very Bond-like about that whole abomination that was Climax Casino Royale was the fact that the name of the show could be turned into a sex joke. Uh, That's really the only thing (laughs) that tied it into the Bond universe at all. (laughs) Everything else was so much different. Um, but like I said, the very basic, it, if you strip it down to the very basic nuts and bolts, James Bond is a British secret agent. Card sense Jimmy Bond was not that. He was not even British. And so we know for a fact that uh, an Americanized Bond is no good. We got plenty of American secret agents, uh, movies and books to choose from. When you want an American spy thriller or something like that, read anything by Tom Clancy. Uh, read anything by Robert Ludlum. I mean, anything you want. There's tons of it out there. Leave Bond alone, America. Come on. <laughs> that's all I got to say. I would say that's definitely, definitely true. And I have cringed every time I have heard of, we almost cast an American. (laughs) Like, for example, like when they did just flat out, um, just to try and sell their potential TV show for Card Sense Jimmy Bond in the CBS television um, live airing show, uh, Climax. Um, Barry Nelson played him as an American agent. Um, 
even though there was supposed to be an international intelligence service, he was still an American. They actually switched out the characters so that Felix was a Brit. It was, and it was just wrong. As you said, you've got so many other Americans and everything else to pick from. In fact, this kind of goes to an argument um, dealing with, in fact, this actually goes to the thing that caused one of the people who played 007 to retire as a full-time actor, Mr. Sean Connery, his experience on League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. He thought it was so terrible, that's why he retired. Oh, I mean, he was gosh. thinking about it anyway, but that's that was what caused him to wow. do it. I didn't think that movie was that bad. I mean, it wasn't good. I'm not trying to claim, I'm not going to be like, oh, that was the best movie ever. Uh, but I didn't think it was that bad. I didn't, I didn't think it was, you know what, every actor that was in this movie should hang it up right now, you're done. <laughs> no, I didn't think it was terrible either. I thought, I, I have to agree with Connery, I thought the director sucked. I, I thought it could have been so much better. I, I really wish we could have had more because there was there were plans for one. I would have loved to have seen more of Peta Wilson as Mina Harker. I would have loved to have seen more of Peta Wilson as Mina Harker. But the point that I was driving at here is the character of Tom Sawyer in that movie was a late addition. And it was demanded by the studio because they said, well, there are no Americans in this movie. And we need an American character. Otherwise, American audiences won't go see it. And my first immediate response in my head is how damn stupid that is. I mean, that's like saying that people go see James Bond movies because they think they'll see Felix Leiter. That's not why you go? Oh, well. No. Uh, And Jeffrey Wright, I mean, he's all right, (laughs) but, you know. And David Hedison, he's cool, but, you know, they're they're just not the main attractions for me. (laughs) But so I think that kind of thinking, which was even more prevalent, of course, back at the time of Climax, episode number three for CBS, marketing to an American audience, that kind of thinking is what drove the switch to make card sense Jimmy Bond as he was shown and it was a disaster. Yeah. So you definitely don't want him to be an American, which also means that when there was a consideration of Adam West as James Bond, that would have just been awful. Yeah, it would have. <laughs> I, I, I would like to it would be one of those things that would only be fun to watch because it would be such a train wreck. Like I like Adam West, don't get me wrong, but he's not Bond. Um you know, just couldn't you couldn't I don't I I cannot see that in a million years. Um uh, there's very few people that I could think would be worse <laughs> at that part. I mean, there's plenty of people who would be bad at it, but it's hard to think of who could possibly actually have been considered that would be worse than Adam West in that particular part. Yeah, I I just can't picture that at maybe, all. Maybe Nicolas Cage. How about how about Nick Cage as James <laughs> Bond? <laughs> Oh man, that is just so raw. It would just be it would just be so awful. But yeah, that's what they did with uh, with Barry Nelson, and that's why he is not. Even though we've <laughs> spent far too long talking about him already, he's not officially on the list of seven. Um, he is. If if we're ranking them, he would be number twenty seven out of eight. <laughs> it's that low on the list. It's it's bad. It's not good. With- at all. With that said, for all the ripping that we've done on Barry Nelson, both just now and when we talked about the episode during our rundown of all of the films and such, I will say that he's had a lot of class about it as a human being. I mean, he readily admits he was not right for the part. He had had no time to run through it. It was live. He was nervous. He didn't think it would work out well, and he calls himself 001 and a half. <laughs> and I think for him to use that particular phrase, I salute him for having that kind of class. Very good, Mr. Nelson. Yeah, he might be a great. I, I I know absolutely nothing about Barry Nelson outside of this particular show, so I don't know if he's a good actor in other parts. I don't I don't think I've seen him in anything else that I can remember, but that doesn't mean he's a bad actor. He's just wrong for James Bond. Yeah, most definitely wrong, wrong, wrong. And I think it also goes without saying that in the unofficial Casino Royale spoof. Now, that's a spoof for a reason. Mm-hmm. And But I think the way that they went about it also explains some things that we want to look for in James Bond, just for the fact that they were not present there. And specifically, I'm looking at David Niven's James Bond, and he was somebody who Ian Fleming kind of had in mind once upon a time. Um, the fact that he's just non-sexual, that he's a had only one real relationship in his life, did not sleep around, did not condone sleeping around, that sort of thing. And it's just so absurd to us 
And it's just wrong, in my mind, to think of Bond as anything other than a Lothario, a Playa, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Yeah, definitely I agree. And again, it, it, because it was a spoof, it can get away with uh, changing the characters around a bit, um, especially since you know half the characters in the uh, movie were called James Bond 007 at some point in the movie. So really, uh, which one could, do we pick on the most? But uh, yeah, that one also doesn't make our official list. So anybody keeping tabs out there, that, that would be you know, Barry Nelson and David Niven, Peter Sellers, and all of them would be eight and nine on the list <laughs> because they're not officially on our list. And then another person whose character was for a moment called 007 in that movie also provides something else that I think is important. And it, this is not as stupid as it sounds at first. James Bond is a ban. So Ursula Andress, as wonderful as she may be, is not James Bond. <laughs> and the reason that I say that this isn't as obvious as it sounds is I remember after the Die Another Day fiasco, and even a little bit before when people were discussing, well, who else could be James Bond? Who else could be James Bond? Maybe it's time to make James Bond a woman. And one of the most frightening things that I'd heard at the time as a name bandied about violates two of these rules we've already discussed. Sarah Michelle Geller. Oh, come on now. No, no. She was fine as Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That's I can accept her in an action role. That's fine. But not as a British secret agent. She's... And especially a British secret agent, I don't, I don't like the idea of them switching around the sexes of the major character like that. I mean, it was, I was almost against them doing it with M. And if it hadn't been for Judy Dench's amazing performance in all of her incarnations as M, I probably would still be against. It. I mean, really, her acting is what saved that move. Uh, but also because that character was somebody who could be replaced because it was a position not an individual person necessarily so it wasn't as bad but bond is bond i mean yeah you can change the actor but i would i mean people are having the same discussion we're, we're having the same discussion about doctor who uh, you know, now let's have a doc uh, have a female doctor who and that i wouldn't have a problem with because their explanation of having different actors is completely different in and bond, i, I supposed to i'm glad you brought that up because i agree with you there I was, I have been on and off with Doctor Who throughout life, and I'm currently in an off mode. But if the rumor about Emma Thompson had been true, I would have been so there. That would have been good. I would have, I would have definitely liked that. I'll watch it either way. But um, yeah, but but that is a totally different scenario because you've got an explanation for the change in actors where the actual character is changing into the visage of this new person so it's okay for that to change and yeah why not make it why not why not make a female doctor go for it but with bond it's not like that you're supposed to ignore the fact that it's a new face it's supposed to be the same character you just you just ignoring the fact that it's a new face because that's what you have to pay for to have a series that runs 50 years you're not going to be able to have the same guy the entire time so i would have definitely been disappointed had they done that that would not have worked at all so i'm glad they didn't now, on the same token, one thing that I would not mind seeing, we, as you mentioned earlier, if you want an American agent, you can always go to Jack Ryan or Jason Bourne or somebody like that. But you really don't see many female agents out there. I wish someone would actually invent one. And I don't mean Jinx, because she sucked. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that was I, I would I would like to see a Bond like character as a woman. That would be interesting. It just can't be Bond. Yeah. No, no, I definitely would agree. Um and there are some books out there that have that. I don't think they've really I don't know if it just doesn't translate to movies as well or or what, but I've seen the majority of the movies where I've seen a female lead in an action role have not been received well. And I think it's be I, I honestly think it's because Hollywood has no idea what to do with it. And they don't often look to people who are willing to try, who would actually understand how to do it. Because I, what I see a lot of times are, okay, we wrote the role for a man, and then we put boobs on him. Yeah. That's that's what I was uh, was going to say as well. It's the only time that I've seen it somewhat work, uh, on screen anyway, tends to be when they make a very mannish female character uh, who, you know, has the mannerisms and basically one of the guys, you know, tomboy type characters. Like, that's the only way you can get away with it. You can't get have an actual feminine female character as a secret agent. And I think that's just a prejudice that, you know, people seem to have about, oh, well, if it's an action role like that, you know, a girl wouldn't want to do that. 
And I think that's BS. I, I, I totally do. But until somebody's able to write it and direct it and film it right, I think we're going to be stuck with, uh, with male leads in the movies for a while. The thing is, I think that there are people willing to write it and direct it and star in it. In fact, I know several of them. They're my Twitter feed. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Hey, Twitter feed, if you're out there, appreciate you. But um, it's just a matter of the big wigs in Hollywood who actually write the checks for millions of dollars, giving these people a chance. Now, I think we're getting more and more. We're, we're getting closer to where that can happen. Even though, if you actually go by the percentages, the number of leading female roles is going down, unfortunately. But I think culturally, I think society is more than ready for it. I mean, I think we've been ready for it for a long time. But I think that if there's ever been a time that was ripe, it's now. And, like, for example, I can think of some people straight off who I think are absolutely ready for a role like that. Like, Katie Sackhoff, I think, would be great for a role like that, as one example. I could definitely see that. Yeah, so... The the time is ripe for a show like that, but again, it's just not Bond. Mm-hmm. It's James Bond. It is not Janice Bond. It's sorry. That's just how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a character that shouldn't be messed with in that way, and that's why it was such a horrible thing that they tried to even make him American. It's, it's that's not the character. The character is a British secret agent. That's what makes part of it work, and that's you know. We're, we're talking about what most exemplifies it. Well, first of all, he does have to be British. doesn't work if he's not. does have to be a he. doesn't work if he's not. It just That's just this character. We're not saying that all action movies should be men only or all spy movies should be men only. Bond should be a man. That's it. That's all we're saying. Um, <laughs> you know, so so keep those, uh, save those letters for another topic. Uh, but uh, yeah, so out of the... Out of the seven, do you want to start with your number seven on the list? Oh. I'm pretty sure, I, I'm, I'm guessing that we agree on this one. This might be the only position that we agree, it may not, but I'm betting that we agree on number seven, the bottom of the barrel for the official Eon series. I'm going to guess that we do, but before we get to that point, I do want to go back to something we started to bring up, and oh. that's the bond as a sexual character Mm -hmm. because i think he very much is i do not think bond is a monk no (laughs) and i think that is essential to his character you can't i don't think you can have a bond who at some point isn't thinking with his dick i'm not saying he does most of his thinking with it or anything like that let's say 30 i do think that's essential to his character (laughs) absolutely no i i completely agree that is definitely necessary because that's First of all, what gets him into trouble half of the time and what gets him out of trouble half the time. I mean, how many times did we see somebody tried to kill Bond and they didn't because they blew up the room he they thought he was going to be in, but he was actually with some girl he just met in her room instead. Um, it's It gets him into trouble and it gets him out of trouble. So it's definitely a major part of the character. And I think it's just part of his personality because... One thing that we have noticed, and I think that this is what makes our list a very, very subjective thing, because I think it'd be really easy for someone to say, well, how did Ian Fleming write it? That's who Bond has to be. I don't agree with that. And the reason I would say that is because, as you mentioned, we have Bond on film going over 50 years. Now, on paper, we have Bond going over 60 years. And so the character has evolved with time. And so they're not all going to agree. They're not all part of the same mold. It's a matter of which one do we feel that we've latched onto that is a good amalgam that, that makes for the essence of the character. And it may have, the character may have started one way, but the character has been played many different ways. Even, a, even across the same actor, yes. we've seen the character change heavily. So I don't think it's as cut and dried as just, well, how did he start? This is very much a subjective thing. And so while we had Bond as a complete, I forget which comic did this, but I just love the way that it's, it was put, a complete male shopping list. Or we have Bond who's more in tune with what would be a quote-unquote modern sensibility of all things being equal, all genders being equal, everybody's treated with the same respect, but you still have that sexuality there. Right. And I, I think he's like a character similar to Dracula, 
and who's another one of my absolute favorite characters of all time, literary and film. Dracula with sexuality, those are always the best stories. I don't necessarily mean he needs to be going at it and all that sort of thing on camera, but just (laughs) that that part of the character has to be present somehow. And if it's not, the story loses so much. So I think Bond is the same way. And I think that's very essential. And that is something that I have taken into consideration as I've come up with my list. All right. Definitely. Uh, you know, I, I agree. It's not necessarily just an easy pick. And it's also, we don't expect everyone to agree with either one of us. I mean, we're probably not even going to agree with each other on this list. So if you're Guaranteed. out there listening and you've got your own opinion of what the list should be, definitely let us know. We'd love to hear it. We have many avenues for you to contact us. We are available on Twitter at Her Majesty's Pod. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash Her Majesty's Pod. We've got our website, which you can comment on this episode episode at uh, guess what her majesty's pod.com you can email me directly at eric at her majesty's pod and you can even email ziggy where can they get you you can email me at ziggy at cinema on the rocks.com you can also find me on facebook and you can also find me on the web at cinema on the rocks.com and you can find me on twitter at cinema otr So we're available. We are accessible. We are not hiding in the corners. We're not hiding in the shadows, fearful of the reprisal of our list. No, we want you to tell us what we got wrong and what we got right, in your opinion. And we will tell you why you are wrong. I mean, we will discuss (laughs) your responses. But uh, so should we should we go ahead and jump in to the actual list? Yep. And we will start. We're going from the bottom and what we're counting as far as we're, we're taking seven places. And what that means is the six actors who have played James Bond in the official Eon 007 movies. And we are also throwing in as a little bit of a Mickey, Ian Fleming's literary interpretation of James Bond. So the character we started with in the books. All right. So starting with number seven, do you want to go or you want me to go? I think we can both go at the same time with this one because I don't think there's any chance that both of us did not say George, George Lazenby. Lazenby. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I had a feeling that we were going to be in sync on this one. Lazenby was awful as Bond. I mean, and, you know, you, you give that movie even more credit than I do. And yet I still knew that you were probably going to pick this one dead last. He was just awful as Bond. I mean, and you knew it was going to be awful right from the very beginning. You know, the second he turned to the camera and broke the fourth wall with that ridiculous, this never happened to the other fellow. Uh, you just knew from that point forward it was going to be crap. And it was. It did not disappoint in that respect. You knew it was going to be garbage and he, he followed through. It was bad. And, uh, and the thing is, it's not just the script he was saddled with. Because honestly, I think that... Any one of the other actors ahead on this list could have played the same script better. Yes. I'm not saying they could have totally saved the film. No. (laughs) But they could have played it much better. And Lazenby, one, he's breaking the Brit rule. He's Australian. Now, granted, he's not heavy, heavy Australian with his accent, but a savvy person can pick it up. And it's... The other thing is he doesn't take the role seriously. That's very plain and... He actually, later on with his own comments, just like, oh, I think this whole thing is done. James Bond just isn't going to go anywhere. And then also, if you look at the comments of others who are working with him, not only did he not take the role seriously, but the fact is he was also not really trained as an actor. He had been a model, a car salesman. The closest he'd come to acting was he was an advertising (laughs) pitchman, and that was it. In fact, when Diana Rigg has done an interview with regard to her role in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, well, she says, well, it's no secret why I was cast, right? It's to balance off the fact that George couldn't act. <laughs> so they needed somebody with actual training and gravitas to balance that off. And she's right. That's exactly what she brought. And that's something that I mentioned when we were discussing the movie. Because Lazenby is just terrible. Yes, it it was just, that's why I refer to it as an abomination. I mean, we talked about that one on our quote unquote abomination episode along with Die Another Day because it was just that bad where we almost don't want to even consider it. We wish we could discount it as easily as we discount Climax and the uh, spoof Casino Royale as being not actual parts 
of the of the of the genre, but uh, unfortunately, that one is an official film, so we have to count him. But he is at the bottom of the pile. Yeah, he's definitely down down there. And again, the reasoning that I'm putting in terms of why he least exemplifies who I think Bond should be: one, not a Brit. Maybe British Empire, but he's not a Brit. <laughs> like Australia is close enough, right? Right? No, it's not. Only if you're a Yankee. By the way, if you're a Yankee, that actually is the term for Yankee comes from a Danish insult, which was meant against the English, Jan Kies, which means John Cheese, because that meant that you had a brain made of cheese. So Yankee actually means cheese head. <laughs> so the New York Yankees are Green Bay Packer fans. But anyway, that's our sports break. We're breaking sports news. <laughs> <laughs> well then, but you learn something new every day, don't you? <laughs> hey, that's what I'm here for. No one will play Trivial Pursuit against me anymore. Uh, I don't know why. It's the weirdest thing. It's like, it's like my dad. We have to do. We have to use a special set of cards for him. We have to pick a set that's harder than everybody else's set. Otherwise, he just he still beats us, but he just blows through us too quick if we don't. <laughs> we have to handicap him at Trivial Pursuit. It's horrible. But, uh, yeah, but, so number seven, by yeah, he's, a long shot. He, he's not a Brit. He doesn't, take, he doesn't take the role seriously as an actor. And because of that, the way the character plays, it doesn't seem like he takes his role seriously as an agent. And even when he's playing at being the agent, it still seems kind of like a flippant lark to him. Plus... In terms of the sexuality, I mean, yeah, okay, he's playing around, and he's trying to seriously court somebody. And and I don't mind that he's actually trying to court Tracy. That's fine, because of the character that she is and the circumstance. That aspect, I'm going to say, is okay, even though we expect Bond to be a player. But when he is being the player, his lines are so cheap. I mean, my God. I mean, I heard people back when I was an undergrad who had much better lines than this. (laughs) No, you're a picture yourself. Come over by the firelight. Ooh. (laughs) Come on. My cat could deliver a line better than that. (laughs) Is that a mirror in your pocket? Because I can see myself in your pants. (laughs) No. These things don't work. They're funny, they're corny, but they're not effective. And when you show them on film being effective, it cheapens the entire experience. So... And James Bond would not be that lame. Nope, not at all. (laughs) Not even sort of. So, uh, and also, as promised, um, in terms of favorites, I think it goes as no surprise. He's also my least favorite of the James Bonds. Yes, I I concur wholeheartedly on that one. So, number seven for both best and favorite on the bottom of the pile, way way down on the bottom of the pile, (laughs) it's George Lazenby. Cheers, George. (laughs) So, who do you have for number six as far as best? Number six for me uh, would have to be more. And I know that might be sacrilegious to some because I know many people who actually think Roger Moore is probably one of the better ones. But from what we have left, I really... Uh, especially near the end. I think what really ruined it for, for me, for him, was that he went too long with it. I think he went about two movies further than he should have gone. He might be higher on the list if he hadn't made those last movies, but with everything being said and averaged out through all, all of his movies, number six for me is Roger Moore. So are you saying that he's your sixth favorite or the sixth best in terms of exemplifying Bond or both? Uh, actually, in this case, it will be both. But okay. uh, specifically, as far as exemplifying uh, Bond, uh, what we're talking about first and foremost, I still put him in, in my number six spot. And then if I was calling my favorites, I would also put him in the uh, in the number six spot. Okay. Any other specific examples of why you think he didn't work or? Well, he does fit some of the bill. I mean, obviously, he's got the Brit thing down. He is a guy, you know, fair enough. Um, and the first couple of movies... He did very well, and had it been just those first ones, he'd be higher on my list. But he went too long, and for me, I have to average it all out. I can't look at just, well, this one movie of his was good, and then these other ones weren't. Um, So averaging it out, I just think the other ones were better for me. Um, But as far as, you know, he definitely, I mean, he's only one step above Lesenby in the number scale, but he's 
20 steps above him in the actual, like, my actual perception scale of him. So I don't mean to put him way down there with Lazenby. It just happens that there's no more steps in between there <laughs> for anybody else to go. So that's where I have to put him. And now, while you're talking about that, I think that the scale in, ter- in terms of this is not a all pieces are equal scale. I think we can both agree that George Lazenby is near the bottom of the barrel, kind of floating on the little puddle that's on top, looking down at um, Card Sense Jimmy Bond, you know, yeah. waving to him beneath the puddle. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Whereas, at least for me, places six and five are a really awesome luxury car that I don't own and probably never will, but would be great to drive. Yes. Number four is that car in my favorite color. And then <laughs> number three, two, and one are that car in my favorite color with really awesome, with a really awesome stereo, you know, just maybe slight different options. <laughs> so basically, like when we get to three, two, one, they're all very close for me. And six and five are pretty close and they're good. I mean, they're better than most of what I can think of otherwise. And four, again, really solid, but just a definite tier difference between five and six. So it's not an evenly spaced scale. Absolutely. No, I completely agree. And that's why it's it's tough. Once you get past that bottom spot, which is so easy to fill, the rest of the spots are are much harder um, to plug in. But, uh, you know, for me, that's Roger Moore. Uh, obviously, since you're uh, y- the way you're grilling me on it, it makes me think that uh, you have a different actor in this particular spot on your list. So who do you have? And, at number six. And you're correct. And I'm almost going to guess that you're going to have psychic powers thinking of who I'm going to say. And I'm going to remind you of your own words that you can't just think of one movie. You have to average it out. Number six for me is Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> He would have been number six for me if it hadn't been for Goldeneye. But uh, no, no, go ahead. Uh, explain yourself, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, one of the problems is he suffers a little bit from the same thing Lazenby did in that for definitely the last two and even his second movie, he looks disgusted while he's playing the part. <laughs> So he's he's not really selling he's not he's not really selling that part of the character. It's he doesn't look like he wants to be there. He doesn't look like he wants it to be him. But also in terms of the way the character plays out, it's not that he doesn't take the job seriously. He does take it seriously, much more so than the Lazenby Bond did. However, he doesn't respect it, I don't think. I mean, he's got his sense of duty because he ran in there and he stole the plane so that um, he could destroy the missile incoming and so on and so forth. But, I mean, it's just in terms of how he dealt with M, in terms of how he treated his mission, it was like, I'm going to do all of this my own way and screw you if you think otherwise, and I'm going to rub it into your face as often as I possibly can. That's, That's kind of the feeling I was getting from him. He was just too much of the lone wolf rogue for me. And also, I found him just to be, while he could play the suave debonair, debonair type, while I could easily, while he easily fit into that mold whenever he needed to, he just always struck me as an arrogant ass. And <laughs> in terms of how, in terms of, and I'm not referring to Pierce Brosnan, the human being, I'm referring to the character he's playing. He just, he very, just very doesn't. important distinction for the, anybody, any Pierce Brosnan lovers out there who are thinking we're we're ragging on him as a human being. No, we're just talking about his portrayal specifically of Bond, and some of that, a lot of that, is not his portrayal of it. It's the writing that he was given. I mean, like what you're talking about right yeah. now with his, uh, you know, forget the man. I'm going to do my own thing. That was really yeah. That's in. all. That's the writing. Yeah, that's that's not him as an actor, but that's what he was given, and so unfortunately, that's what we have to judge on in this case. And in terms of Bond as the sexual character, um, I mean, obviously he's got the his Christmas comes more than once a year. <laughs> Love it. Best part of the movie, probably. But I think that his Bond treats it almost entirely as a domination exercise and just an instinct that needs to be dealt with. Whereas I think my idealized character of Bond takes it as a multi-level thing where. I mean, yeah, sometimes it's a power thing. 
a lot of times it's a I need to get something and this is how I'm going to get it thing. But also I do think that this is one of his three great pleasures in life. Because the other thing that we see about Bond is on the rare occasions that you've gotten to see his home or his office, he's pretty Spartan. So he takes luxury where it's fleeting doses. And I think that's nights of great sex. That's having amazing meals that cost hundreds of dollars, you know, the finest beluga caviar, Bollinger champagnes, and so on, Mm -hmm. the hot rides and hot hotels. So I think these fleeting pleasures are actually important to him as pleasures. Yes. And I think Mr. Bitey Bond just doesn't see it that way as much. (laughs) Maybe he just wants to mix his pleasures of food with his pleasures of sex. Maybe he's just combining the two. You don't know. (laughs) You don't know Ew. what he's into. <laughs> if, if he's if if he's James Bond Dahmer, I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't have to go that far per se, but uh, no, I, I I totally understand uh, your points. Um, again, I I actually agree with most of them. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, is that all you've got for number six? Do we want to move on to number five? I also want to note that in terms of on the favorite scale, your favorite. Sorry about that. He's number five for me. So he moves up a place on the favorite scale, but in terms of exemplification, I would put him at number six. Okay. Uh, well, for me, um, Brosnan falls in our very next spot, <laughs> number five. Um, again, basically for all the same reasons that you just said. Um, you know, he's down there on the list. I like him as Bond a little bit more than more but i think but it's very very close for me i mean those two could easily flip flop i mean they both had some bad movies at the end but when it comes down to it for me uh both in what i think of what bond should be and as my favorites um i think that connery did a better job overall especially since of course you know one of my favorites and one of the ones that i still consider to be up there on the list it may not be the best but it's still up there on the list is goldeneye and none of Moore's movies make it to my ultimate like top five list. So I really can't classify him any higher than that. But as far as who a Bond should be, I think uh, Brosnan falls at number five for me. Uh, so he's still bottom of the pack. He's not quite in the middle yet. Um, and again, I mean, it's really, I, I, don't, I don't think I can think of any other reasons that you didn't mention as to why you put him on number six. Um, I will say, as my favorites list... Um, he actually does actually fall at number two. <laughs> he actually comes in quite a bit higher on my favorite Nothing wrong list. with that. And that is almost exclusively to do with Goldeneye. The fact that Goldeneye still is, is maintaining my spot at number one, my favorite personal Bond movie. Um, and so there's no way that Brosnan can fall too far down on the favorite Bond list and have that movie still be so high. So for me, he's number two in the favorites list, but uh, number five in the actual Bond list. I'm going to say that you surprised me in terms of putting him that far down. Hmm. Interesting choice. Well, again, like I said, he's really high up on my favorites list. (laughs) But uh, as far as uh, what a Bond should be, I do think he's outshone by several others on the list. So. Okay. And for my number five, um, you can basically what I'm doing is I'm flip flopping who I would put as best and favorite. So my number five best is my number six favorite. And that would be Ian Fleming's literary James Bond. Wow. That far down, huh? That far down. Wow. Wow. I'm, I'm actually quite surprised that he's that far down on the list to be quite honest with you. But uh, explain yourself, sir, uh, once again. <laughs> Basically, I think that M's description of Pierce Brosnan's Bond and Goldeneye most fittingly goes with Ian Fleming's 007. He's a misogynist dinosaur and a relic of the Cold War. And unlike the Bond of the films, he doesn't adapt. He doesn't change. He doesn't really move with time. And even over the, and we're looking at the course of just a decade and a half of writing, but even over the course of four years in film, we see the bonds grow and morph even just a little bit. But this bond does not. And while that's perfectly fine for literature, and I'm okay with reading it, it's a matter of one, in terms of being a real spy, I think you have to be able to change. I think you have to have that adaptability. And two, the character that he's stuck at just doesn't work for me. And he doesn't work for me both personally 
and in terms of what he would need to be to be a success at what he does. He is not just a player and a chauvinist, but he's a flat he is a flat out misogynist. I mean, even when he's falling in love, he thinks about the quote unquote sweet tang of rape. <laughs> That line still kills me. <laughs> and he is, he's a horrible racist. And you can't afford to be that in a global world, in a world of global espionage, where you're just automatically thinking that anyone whose last name ends in ski, for example, is obviously subhuman. Or some, and that's paraphrasing a line from Goldfinger, actually. Um, or where you have the lesser mongoloid types. And so it's just, the, the Ian Fleming's obsessions with gender and race and also sexual orientation because obviously all gay men are weak and all butch lesbians just are waiting for real men to turn them. Not my words by any means. <laughs> and this is why this goes down to sixth favorite for me. I don't, I think that that's not only distasteful to me. But on a personal level, but also in terms of being able to work at the job he has to do, it's a detriment to his work. So I, that's why I put him that low in the ideal scale. I, I cannot possibly imagine him any higher. Wow. Well, all right. <laughs> wow. That's that's quite a bit lower than I would have thought. And I, I completely understand your reasoning, but um, it's still being that that is the actual basis of the character. It, it surprises me that it's that low. But um, I, I don't fault you for your reasons at all. So makes sense. And I think that's how much stock I put into the fact that Bond needs to adapt with time. And it, as we've been discussing all along, in the movies, and this is one of the brilliant maneuvers made by Cubby Broccoli and Barbara afterwards, he has always made sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle shifts to go with the era in which the film is being made. So he can stay timeless as an archetype, but he can bend and adapt the cultures that are around him. And I think that's part, that's the main reason why we can still enjoy these films freshly half a century later after they started. And I think that's also why people look at the Ian Fleming Bond books more in the same fashion that they would look at things like PBR. It's retro, <laughs> not that it's current. So the adaptability is a huge thing for me for this character. That makes sense. I, I completely understand. Um, I don't know if I 100% agree, and we'll get to that when we get further into the list, I'm sure. But uh, I, I completely understand your reasoning there. Yeah, and point isn't to agree. If we had the same list, it'd almost be kind of boring. Yes. And now we're going to get to the exact midpoint of the list where we do a drum roll and where if I wasn't getting hate mail before, I'm getting it now. Uh oh. <laughs> Who is your Number numero quattro? Numero quattro, both in terms of best and favorite is Mr. Sean Connery. Oh, okay. Um, I'm actually not as shocked as I thought I was going to be. I do have him a little bit higher, but um, I'm not uh, I'm not as shocked as, as I thought I might be, to be quite honest with you. Um, so you've got him as number four, both favorite and as a Bond. Yes. And why is that? It <laughs> Now, he, I totally get this, much, much as with the discussion we just had about the literary character, he invented this character for the screen. And he invented this character for the screen in such a way that allowed all of the rest to follow. If Connery had sucked his bond in Dr. No, From Russia With Love, Goldfinger, the series could not have gone on. So we owe the existence of this franchise to Sean Connery. So I'm not going to dispute that. And like I said, we're getting to the point now where this is luxury car material, man. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, it's almost like between four and one, we're picking nits. Absolutely. But, no, I completely agree with that. It, it's real and, tough to, to pick through the last, especially the last three. But even at this spot, it's, it's still kind of hairy. Yeah. And well, especially if you've ever seen Connery with his shirt off. But anyway... <laughs> Wow. Wow. Went with the hair joke, did you? All right. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. 
well, they, they made it and you only live twice. So that, that's what made me think of it was, was the turning Japanese scene where Japanese men have nice bare chests. It just cracks me up whenever I think about that scene. <laughs> you want a hairy bond to get uh, Robin Williams in the part. And there we go. Kirkwood just, Smith. <laughs> just a ape with shaved hands <laughs> and face, basically. <laughs> now, he does a great Connery impression, and I would love to see him doing a full-on Bond impression. That would be just hilariously awesome. It would not work for a movie. But, no, um, in now, terms the of... That, uh, that Connery is Scottish and not British put him... Does, did that help no, put him down on the Scotland list? Scotland is part of Great Britain, and that's perfectly fine. Okay. All right. <laughs> so basically what I'm looking at is as long as he is part of the great of of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. So what we're looking at is English, Scottish, Welsh, or Irish. And I know we have political disputes about Ireland. I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to say <laughs> I would accept Irish, okay? So Pierce yeah. Brosnan was perfectly fine on that scale. Born Irish, raised English. But anyway... Um, <laughs> And in fact, Fleming was so appreciative of what he thought of Connery in the role, because originally he balked at the idea of Sean Connery playing James Bond. That's why the canon James Bond in the book turned out to be half Scots, half Swiss. That was in tribute to what Fleming saw Connery do with the role. So that's perfectly fine. No problem. There you go. Um, In terms of why I put him where I put him, part of it is the adaptability thing. I think out of all of the Bonds that we have left, he was the worst at it. And because either he wasn't adapting much at all for his first few films, and then when it got to the point where he had to, like we're talking Diamonds Are Forever and Never Say Never Again, it just didn't work very well. It would, it, it, you could tell, if you were mentioning Roger Moore should have quit earlier. I mean, I'm glad Connery didn't quit. In well, actually, as we mentioned, he's the Brett Favre of the franchise. The he retired. First time. Thought about it, <laughs> came back, retired, w- then played for his the his former mentor's uh, enemy. But <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm I'm glad that he came back the first time for Diamonds Are Forever because and only because Lazenby was so bad. If Lazenby hadn't been that bad, if he'd have been decent, or if they'd have gotten somebody else decent to fill that part, if they'd have gone straight to Moore at that point, or or, you know, uh, wasn't was that the point when Dalton was up for the role, or was it later before? No, Dal- Dalton was considered Brosnan, when Lazenby was actually cast, and right, then right. Dalton turned it down because he thought he was too young. It, and would have been objectively young speaking, Bond. he was probably right. <laughs> but even still, I would have rather had a young Dalton than Lazenby. But anyways, uh, the point is, yes, he was necessary to come back. He probably saved the franchise at that point. Coming back for Diamonds I, Are Forever. I agree, and and that's why even though. I cringe at some of the things I see in Diamonds Are Forever. I mean, it it almost gets to the point where we're seeing Sean Connery playing a spoof of 007. (laughs) In fact, I would say even more so than with Never Say Never Again, because at least at that point, we're dealing with a guy who's admitting how old he is. Yeah. Well, at least... Whereas with Connery and Diamonds Are Forever, technically he's not that old, because Roger Moore is older than he is. It's just, he moved on to being beyond... to not being Bond, and you could tell he he wasn't really into it. Yeah. And he wasn't really into it for You Only Live Twice, either, by the time we were done. So, and before that, it was just this... I couldn't really take him seriously as a spy spy. I could take him seriously as a blunt instrument type person, um, special forces type, but as a... and as somebody who could go into clubs and so on, but in terms of Overall, he just was more blunt instrument than spy to me. I'm not saying he wasn't at all credible as a spy, but compared to the people who are above him on my list, I think he's less credible and more of a blunt instrument. All right. I can definitely see that. Um, <clears throat> so we're on number four, right, for the, the Bonds? That that was, yep. So we had Sean Connery as my number four on both counts. Who's dropping number four for you? Number four, and this is only on the Bond scale. Um, he actually does score a little bit higher on my favorite scale. But on the Bond scale, my number four is Timothy Dalton. And not okay. because he was bad. Again, like you were saying, we're in luxury car territory here. We're, we're into the good stuff already. And uh, I did like Dalton as Bond. I liked those two movies. However, it was just those two movies. 
And even though I, you know, I, I, I know people are probably out there, you damn hypocrite. You just told me the other guy was bad because he did too many. Well, Dalton didn't do enough. <laughs> so <laughs> somewhere in the middle would be my, uh, my ideal aim point, I guess. But, uh, I just can't rate him higher than that based on only those two movies. If I'd have had more of him, he might have rated higher. But <clears throat> for, for me, I need to see a little bit more before they could rate really higher on the, the bond scale. Now I will say Dalton does rank number three on my favorites list though. So, uh, he is up there on my favorites because I really did enjoy those two movies and uh, I did like him in that role. I just don't think I saw enough of him to rank higher in the actual bond scale. If Fair enough. <laughs> also, because he was playing a little bit darker bond at the time, it didn't really fit in for me with the rest of the bond. I liked it personally. I liked the take on the character, but uh, rating it in a scale of what fits into the actual character, I have to put that lower because he did kind of stray from what I felt the base of the character was a little bit in a good way for me as an, as an enjoyer of the movies. But as far as a bond, I got to rank him a little bit lower than some of the others. Okay. And then how would you, who would you then go with number three? Number three is your number four, uh, Sean Connery. I think that uh, Sean Connery comes in at number three for me as a bond. And again, a, a lot of it has to do with the reason he's that high on the list is because he started it. The reason he's so low on the list, uh, the reason he's not number one or number two, is because he went on so long, and by the end of it, it wasn't really all there. And I have to take points away for never, for never say never again, because I just felt that well, it probably, it, basically, I think he saved the Eon Bond franchise twice by coming back. He saved it the first time by coming back for Eon after the Lazenby experiment. And then he saved them again by being so bad in Never Say Never Again that uh, they never bothered. That, that, that offshoot never took off. <laughs> but um, overall, because the first ones, because he exemplified what the character on screen would be, I have to rank him fairly high. And so he hits the number three spot for me. As a favorite, he's at number four. Fair enough. I would say to your point about Never Say Never Again... As bad a movie as it was, it was actually pretty successful. I mean, Octopussy did do better. And I think it did put finally to rest the question of, you know, can we get past Sean Connery ever? Or are we always going to be, this is Sean Connery's role that someone else is sitting in? Mm -hmm. I I think it put that question to rest because that was still a live question even in 1983. But I, so I'm not going to say that he saved Eon again by being so bad in Never Say Never Again. Because really, the movie was bad, and he skated along with it. <laughs> well, that's what I, I mean. I don't mean that he was horrible in the role, but I mean, the whole movie itself, for me, was just. I did not enjoy it very much at all. I, I did not think it was a good addition to the Bond franchise, and I'm glad that it. I don't have to count it as an official member of the franchise. Um, and so I think that that the fact that he was that that movie was not superior to the other to the Eon films that were out at the same time, kind of helped Eon out quite a bit. So that's I that's think it why did I help, say, but I don't think it reaches a level of saving. Fair enough. Fair enough. Close. Close though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still taking partial credit for that one. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, for me, once we start getting into the top three, it's so damn close. In fact, the person I'm putting in at number three, for a while, I had actually placed higher on the list. And th this is basically an hour before we recorded is when I finally finalized my top three. That's how close this got. I just finalized them a few minutes ago while we were talking. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> But sort of. I wouldn't put it past you. <laughs> no, I've been. I I, I re-went over them, but I did end up with the same list that I had had previously. Cool. My number three for both um, exemplification and for favorite is Timothy Dalton. I really, really liked his performance. I thought he got a very, very bad rap. Um, from the public at large. And actually, both his movies were successful. Not as successful as people expected, but they were successful. Um, and in terms of his character, I think that the character was one of the most credible as an espionage agent. 
And he also had the definite toughness of the physical character. You totally believed him in a fight. You totally believed him when he was sitting there, not just pulling out a gun and being in a regular, you know, gunplay shootout. But this is a Bond I believed as a sniper and as a guy that they would call to be a sniper. So that that scene really did a lot for me. And also the fact that he made the decision to just wing Kara rather than to kill her and just say, I only kill professionals. Uh, yes, that's an act of defiance, but I don't think it's the kind of defiance that you saw from the Pierce Brosnan bond or for, definitely not from the George Lazenby bond. This was... This was something different. This was more respectable to me. Yeah, it wasn't defiance for the sake of defiance. It was defiance based on, like, he saw things. He's like, no, this, something isn't right here. And so the plans need to change because the plan was I was supposed to take out a hired gun. This isn't a hired gun. This is something is wrong here. And I recognize this because I'm so darn smart and I'm a super agent, which is what he's supposed to be. So. I totally, I totally agree with you. That was not an act of like, well, no, I'm in you. It was more of a situation changes. My actions need to change with them. I'm not just going to follow orders blindly and then be like, oh, she wasn't a professional. Well, man, you didn't tell me. You told me to kill her, so I killed her. <laughs> not my fault. And I also think that the that this Bond and the two above, and I'll also go back and grab Ian Fleming's Bond for this. One thing that they all have that I do appreciate is they have a code of professional conduct that they wear with them that you can tell they have. I didn't actually picture that out of Sean Connery at all. And I certainly didn't picture it in Pierce Brosnan's or Lazenby's Bond. I just didn't picture a code. Whereas Ian Fleming's Bond, Timothy Dalton's Bond, they're acting by a code of conduct, which I do think is essential to this kind of character realistically. And at the same time, you also have have a guy who is comfortable with the finer things in life, enjoys them, um, still a player. Like, for example, when he lands on the yacht, uh, call you back in an hour. Better make that too. You know, that that's fine. But we all the one the places where I'm gonna where I ended up deciding that he wasn't going to be higher on the list, whereas originally I thought he was, is one the character got very much nerfed for the 1980s because this was this was when the AIDS scare first happened, mm-hmm. and I'm not and by AIDS scare I mean when AIDS was first really described to the public and people were frightened of it because. They had no idea how to treat it, no idea what to do with it. I mean, it is still scary now. I'm not downplaying that at all. It's just, it was the unknown that everybody was dealing with at the time. And so they decided to write Bond as a little bit less sexual. He was still there, but a little less. And that just doesn't quite fit the mold as much for me. And even though he wears the gentleman's trappings well and looks totally comfortable in a looks well let me rephrase that looks totally at home in a club it's like he's wearing them as a disguise mm-hmm. and that's he's a little bit rougher what, around the edges than some of the others he's a guy who i can totally imagine just being on standard military rations and not minding it as much whereas with uh, with any of the others except for ian fleming's bond uh no nothing but a luxury hotel is gonna do damn it <laughs> so those are the points that dropped him down from the top two spots for me even though i think that you have a fantastic performance and an overall good and an overall really good interpretation of james bond's secret agent and in terms of the rebellion in license to kill that also jives with me because that was such a deep-seated personal revenge you have his best friend going through exactly what happened to him with Blofeld and Tracy. I'll buy that. I'm not going to discount that as stupid rebellion. Again, same thing. I, I can totally agree, and that's why Dalton ended up a number three on my favorites list. I only had one spot lower on the Bond list, and uh, you said Dalton was number three both for both, right? For you? Yep, number three for both, which leaves okay. each of us with our top two positions. So I'm going to let you have the decision. Do you want to name your number two or your number one? Um, well, I think we had uh, discussed we wanted to leave a little bit of mystery up to the number one spot, which means we would have to say it now, because right now we both have two remaining. If we announce our number two right now, everybody will automatically know what the number one is before we even say it. So um, why don't we go ahead and skip to number one, and then we'll we'll go back to number two to uh, to explain 
after the fact. What do you say? Sounds good. I will say that I'm going to give you the honor of naming your number one first. All right. And uh, this is this is where I was a little shocked earlier because this one is the one that I had the biggest difference uh, between my Bond scale and my favorite scale. And my favorite scale, this one is much, much lower, but I put it much, much higher on the Bond scale. And it's because I kind of disagree with something you said a little bit earlier. I have my number one as Ian Fleming's Bond. And it's because I kind of disagree uh-huh. with yours. <laughs> it's because I kind of disagree with that statement about, uh, it, it, I believe that Bond is Bond because of what Ian Fleming put down on paper. And so for me to say that any Bond other than his is better than his Bond, it, he might be a better character, he might be a better spy, he might be a better secret agent, he might be a better person, <laughs> definitely. But as far as being a better Bond, I don't think you can get better than the original vision of the author. Um, now, as far as my favorites list, he's all the way down to number five because of all the things that you said, because he's just, he's not a very nice person. <laughs> he's kind of a, <laughs> he's kind of a bad guy. He's, he's not really, he's not the cool swab, suave debonair kind of you know cool guy that's like oh yeah yeah." he gets all the girls because he's nice and they want to be with him no it's more like he gets the girls because they're scared and they think i better do this or something bad's gonna happen (laughs) um it's he's not a very nice guy at all and in fact it was very it was a very tough call for me to put him even above moore's bond and that is even as far as my favorites and that's even possibly I could I could flip flop that on a dime. I mean that's really the one that I was going back and forth. I'm like, do I like it more or worse? But when it comes right down to it, for me personally, if I'm looking at the character of James Bond, I have to go first to that literary character. Now, does he fit in the modern day? No, of course not. Is he a good person? No. Is he uh, somebody that I'd want to hang out with on a Saturday night? Hell no. Um, this is not the type of person I'd want in my life in any capacity whatsoever. But as far as who is Bond for me number one is the original okay now I I look at a character once you get to the point where you accept that anyone other than the first person who created the character can write that character Mm -hmm. as an up for grabs thing at that point where yes we thank the original author for the archetype that we started with and we, we look to that as a framework but you can do better or you can do worse. I don't think that it's, I I honestly don't think that you're stuck with that as the only example. And again, one of the things that I most like about my ideal of who James Bond is, is his adaptability. And Ian Fleming's James Bond, he makes it through the 50s, and he makes it through your dad's 60s, as opposed to the hippie 60s. And that's about as far as he can ever go. Right. Where and we also have, and this is I this is an interesting contrast because Ian Fleming himself describes Bond as he doesn't ha- he doesn't hang on to worldly goods, so he takes pleasure where he can. And Ian Fleming specifically talks about the alcohol, the cars, and the meals as the places he goes for. Mm-hmm. But he stops there. He doesn't. Bond does not. Um, go for the fancy clothes, but his Bond doesn't wear a tuxedo. His Bond wears the most nondescript suit you can possibly find. And as a spy who blends into the background, I could see that. But it just seems an odd contrast to this character that he's developed that he's saying, well, he lives for the now, where, it, okay, so even when you're not working, you're like this. This, And again, the whole sex isn't really fun for him. It's just, okay, if I don't get my rocks off every so often, I'll get go insane. So that's, that's why I can't, I understand your argument, but that's why I can't subscribe to it myself. And that's fine. I, I didn't expect you to. I was honestly, uh, until you said what you had said earlier, I thought we might be on the same page as number one. But then once you said that, I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> things are going to get hairy at number one. But uh, no, that's, to, uh, that, and that's, all those reasons are why he's so far down on the list of my favorites. But uh, again, that's that's just the way I, I qualify it for me. Um, his adaptability, for me, it doesn't need to adapt outside of 
the particular story it's written into. Yes, the character as a whole needs to adapt because we're continuing to write. And even as other authors have taken on the mantle and have written for Bond, the character has adapted to fit the times because you have to. Otherwise, you're not going to sell books. You're not going to sell. You're not going to sell tickets to the movies. Um, but as far as just the the basic character, while he may not be a nice guy, he is Bond. And for me, that's that's where he falls. But I guess that just leaves us with one last spot on the list, our number twos. Well, or no, you, I, I haven't read my number one yet. Yeah, I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. I'm out of it. Wow. So, uh, go ahead. <laughs> so, my number one is a James Bond who, while not perfect, because... No one's going to fit the absolute ideal that you put into your mind when you can amalgamate from so many different portrayals, not just these seven, but even the ones that we discounted earlier on and then others that exist out there. Um, But the one who comes closest, the one James Bond who I can see as fitting almost all the molds I'm looking for, he's definitely... Um, from Britain, he is very much um, the comf- the person who's very comfortable playing and working, the person I can believe as a spy, the person I can believe as a blunt instrument, the person I can believe as a sniper, the person who has sex for fun as well as for work and as well as for just, you know, releasing tension, the person who enjoys life to the full while he can enjoy it the most, the person who's going to crack lo- crack jokes and have a sense of humor about life, because it's also how he makes it through his job every day while still also being cold as hell. Yes. The person who I can see existing without any changes other than wardrobe in 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, the millennium, and now into the teens is Daniel Craig. Woo, yay. Oh, um, no, I, I can totally see all of that. And uh, as you may have, if you were paying attention, you'll notice that Craig is the only one I haven't mentioned yet. So he's obviously my number two. Um, I, I can completely see that. Um, I do very, very, very much enjoy uh, the Daniel Craig version of Bond. These new movies have been fantastic. As I said uh, last episode, Skyfall could very easily take number one in my favorite movies, my favorite Bond movies list. And, well, it, it could easily get up there in my top five or ten movies list in general um, with a few more watchings. So Daniel Craig is definitely a great, great Bond. And I hope that he's able to do it a few more times. I hope that he doesn't overstay his welcome <laughs> like we like we discussed with, uh, with some of the others. Um, I think he's still definitely well in the prime right now. So I would, I would definitely love to see at least one more with him, and possibly two. We'll see where it goes from there. But I, I, I do agree with you that he is a great, great Bond. As far as his longevity goes, we know we're getting him for the next one. And personally, I think his longevity depends entirely on if the studio gets its ass in gear. Yes. Because as we've, as we've mentioned, there's no reason to have three, four years in between, in between movies. I personally still think that we could do this where you, they come out annually if you, if you made them the right way. Um, that said, I'll accept every two years. I think if we get a Bond movie every two years, he's got three movies left. If we have the schedule that it looks like we're going to have, I think he's got two. And this is even by his own admission. When he was waiting for Skyfall, he was like, uh, hey, guys, I'm getting a little older and the stunts are starting to hurt. <laughs> even though he trains like hell and he does most of his stunts himself. Mm-hmm. I mean, nobody, not even Jackie Chan, and I have heard this from people who've worked with him directly, um, d- not even Jackie Chan does all of his own stunts. He does almost all of his own stunts. Same thing. Daniel Craig does not do all of his own stunts, and he uses a stuntman more often than Jackie Chan will. But he still does for a front-facing Hollywood actor. 
a lot more stunts than most. Yes. So he's still working at it. And it it. pays off. I love when actors do that because they don't have to suddenly go to the wide shot where you're seeing your main star only from behind. And you're like, this is hair. That hair doesn't look quite right. Or something, you know, some of these obvious moves. And then like now they tried to do the digital, like, oh, we'll have the stuntman in there, but we're going to digitally put the star's face on it. And it's so obvious. You can tell. (laughs) Even with all the newer technology, it is still so obvious. So whenever the stars are able to do their own stunts, it definitely makes a big difference in the final quality of the film. And so we appreciate it when they're able, willing and able, and the studio is willing to let them do it. Because that's the other problem, is that uh, sometimes they're just worth too much. They'll be like, yeah, I'll do it. And the studio's like, oh, no, you won't. <laughs> you know what's going to happen if you break your arm in that? We're out $20 million. No. <laughs> Forget that. And that, by the way, is why Jackie Chan does not do all of his own stunts. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, some of these guys are just worth too much to risk certain things. But ultimately, I, I think they should be allowed to do anything they are capable of doing uh, because it does make for a better film. You're allowed much more wide range of angles to shoot from. You don't have to worry about hiding faces. You don't have to worry about digital effects after the fact. You can just shoot the damn movie, and it looks great. Uh, and it's in terms of everything that I expect out of the Bond character as close as I'm ever going to get to a checks off every box on the list. Daniel Craig is Bennett. And I'm, I was actually very surprised when I first saw him in Casino Royale because I wasn't going in as a hater because I, I was going with an open mind, but I was thinking, how could somebody possibly do this? And he just blew me away. And from the moment I saw Casino Royale, and it's just been reaffirmed each time, even though we had what wasn't as good a quality movie in Quantum of Solace um, in between there. Craig and the Bond that was presented, played by Craig. So both his performance and the writing were just solid throughout. So for me, Craig's just it. However, on my favorites list, he's number two. Oh, a <laughs> little flippy floppy there, because uh, as, uh, as I stated, I only have number two left, and Craig was the only one who I didn't uh, state yet. So obviously, Daniel Craig is my number two, Just and, and this is only just a tiny, tiny, tiny hair under number one spot. But as far as my favorites go, Craig definitely has that spot. So he is my number one favorite. Whereas in my number two spot is somebody who is much, much lower on your list, (laughs) Roger Moore. And he does stand as my favorite, James Bond. I think that's the biggest disparity between the two of us is our Moore and Fleming spots. (laughs) Definitely. Um, For me, if I'm just sitting down and saying, I want to watch a James Bond movie and I reach for one, I am more likely to reach for one of Roger Moore's movies than anyone else's movies. That's just how it happens. They're the ones that I end up playing the most often. I know that in most cases, they're not the best, but I find I have lots of fun with them, even when it gets to the point where it's absolutely silly. And the Bond that we're seeing is not necessarily the idealized Bond that I've been describing this whole time. I just have too much fun watching him. I mean, this idealized Bond, would he have Zomji lasers? Of course not. (laughs) But... (laughs) Pew, pew, pew! (laughs) But it's just so much fun to watch. I, I can't help it. And the same thing about you know, being on Atlantis and so on. And yet we also have really high quality spy films on the order of For Your Eyes Only and Octopussy. So he can, he's played the whole gamut and out of all of them, we've gotten to see him adapt the most. I mean, he's played basically four different versions of James Bond because you had how he first showed up in Live and Let Die. And then you had the hard edge experiment in Man with the Golden Gun that didn't work so well. You had the silly Bond of Spy Who Loved Me. Actually, five, really, because then you <laughs> then you had the Cold Warrior Bond of For Your Eyes Only and Octopussy, and then you had, okay, I will do this one more time for a view to a kill. An old man Bond. Um, see, and that almost that exact reason is one of the one of the reasons that he is so far down on my list is the fact that 
he never really, for me, solidified in anything because he was so different and it wasn't a natural progression for me. It was more like, a, I'll try it this way this time and I'll try it this way this time and we'll do it this way this time. And because it never solidified for me, that's why it fell on the list. And for you, I guess that brought it up. <laughs> so again, yeah, this is entirely I, I, I subjective. It was but more of... I'm sorry, go on. Oh, no, I, that's that's all I was going to say is that it is, it just more exemplifies the fact that this list is entirely subjective because for the same reasons almost, I ranked it lower and you ranked it higher for the exact same thing. Yeah, cause I, I thought that he, he was, his performances and the writing for his character really moved with the times and yet... In each case, Moore did a very good job of finding the center. And I recently read um, his retrospective on the character, uh, Bond on Bond. Um, My one complaint about the book is that it's really expensive for something that's that short. (laughs) But um, still, if you find it, it's in it's interesting to read the anecdotes. Uh, Read it in the bookstore or if you can find it cheap. Um, And he was saying that the way he found his center for how he played Bond is in one of Fleming's stories, he read the line that Bond didn't actually like to kill, but he'd do it if he had to. Now, and that's interesting because I don't think that Fleming's Bond ended up acting that way consistently, but that's what Moore decided his center was. And that I think is pretty consistent throughout. And it's just an interesting choice as far as how to play it. Now, the thing that appalled me as I was reading his book and was that, he calls James Bond, Jim, Jimmy, Jimbo. I'm just like, because that, that's another thing. No, his name is James. It is very clearly James. It is not Jim. And it sure as hell ain't Jimbo. The only, the only person I think who ever called him Jimbo on screen was uh, uh, the CIA character in the Brosnan movies. Wade. Yeah, Jack Wade. And I'm like, why can't I think of his name all of a sudden? But yeah, that's the only person. And he was doing it specifically to be the brash American who doesn't care about what you actually want to be called. I'm going to call you what I want to call you. So I completely understand that because that was pretty lame. And then, of course, in Live and Let Die, you have the taxi driver calling him Jim and everyone and anyone in Harlem calling him Honky. But oh, yeah, that's <laughs> that was something different. We discussed that at length. Still cracks me up. But it so it's interesting that even the person who I'm calling my very favorite portrayal of Bond, I still have a problem with something, but it has nothing to do with the movies. It's just I it it shocked me as I was reading his his book that he would refer to Bond as anything other than James. It it actually shocked me. Because yeah, to me, it, that's it just fine. one of those fundamental things. Yeah, you're like, what are you thinking? I guess it, he was probably thinking it was just adding some color, but no, I don't like it either, and I haven't even read it. <laughs> I'm just going to call it right now. I don't like it. How do you like now that, Raji? Huh? Yeah, you don't like it very much, Rajbo. All right, didn't think so. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> now, with that said, in his own book, Roger Moore calls Con- calls for Connery, and I totally respect that. You know that, like, like we said, this is a very subject, subjective list. But for my money, I think the best is Daniel Craig, and my favorite in terms of whose movies I'm going to reach for the most is Roger Moore. And for me, it, uh, my my best Bond is, of course, the original Bond from Ian Fleming. But uh, as far as the movies I'm going to reach for first are probably going to be the most recent, so it's going to be Daniel Craig. And if I reach for something beyond that, it's probably going to be Goldeneye. So Brosnan falls in there at number two. Um, and honestly, the only reason that more might fall in there higher on my favorites would be because I might grab... Uh, for your eyes only, just because, uh, you know, for nostalgia's sake, more than because of, I enjoy the movie that much. But uh, honestly, I think my my scale, um, pretty much, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about it. I'm like, yeah, Craig is my number one, Brosnan is my number two favorites, uh, then Dalton, Connery, then the books, then more. And that pretty much goes how I would, that's pretty much the order I would grab them in if I was going to watch or read a book. That's That's where I would go first, I think. So I think it I think it works out. So do we want to uh, do want to recap the list real quick in case anybody uh, missed the order? My recap for my personal list, starting with who best exemplified um, the Bond at ideal as I see it at number seven, I put George Lazenby 
At number six, I put Pierce Brosnan. At number five, I put Ian Fleming's Original Literary Bond. At number four, I put Sean Connery. At number three, I put Timothy Dalton. At number two, I put Roger Moore. And at number one, I put Daniel Craig. Now, in terms of favorites, at as far as the ones whose performances or portrayals I find the most entertaining um, and would be most likely to grab and watch. And I, I think it's more of a, and even then that's kind of deceptive because I will, pr- just because of sheer math, I'm more likely to grab a Connery film than a Dalton film. But in terms of, <laughs> just because there are more of them, yeah. but in terms of, you know, just enjoying the performance overall. Um, at number seven, still George Lazenby. <laughs> at number six, Ian Fleming's Literary Bond. At number five, Pierce Brosnan. At number four, Sean Connery. Number three, Timothy Dalton. Number two, Daniel Craig. And number one, more, Roger Moore. <laughs> and for me, my list uh, for what best exemplifies the Bond character, uh, number seven, of course, is still going to be <clears throat> George Lazenby, excuse me. Uh, number six, clocks in at Roger Moore. Number five, Pierce Brosnan. Number four was Timothy Dalton. Number three was Connery. Number two was Daniel Craig. And number one was Ian Fleming's literary version. However, on the scale of my personal favorites, uh, number seven still is George Lazenby. <laughs> <laughs> number six is also Roger Roger Moore. Number five is Fleming's books. Uh, number four is Sean Connery. Number three is Dalton. Number two is Brosnan. And clocking in number one is Daniel Craig. Now, here's a question for you. Yes. Out of anyone that you can think of, not necessarily current, this is from any era, is there anyone else that you can think of that you might have liked to have seen as James Bond, or at least who could have been an interesting choice had one of these Bonds not been available and they needed to recast in any particular era. Ooh, that's a tough one because it's hard. First of all, I don't follow um, British actors all that much. I mean, outside of my very limited uh, watching of British television shows such as Sherlock and uh, Top Gear and you know Doctor Who and that sort of thing. Um, so it, it's really tough to say, though I had kind of bounced the idea around in my head about what it would be like to see Benedict Cumberbatch as Bond, but I don't know if that would work. I think he would make a better Bond villain, especially after seeing Star Trek Into Darkness. Him as Khan was fantastic. Spoiler alert, sorry. Um, but, uh, I, I can't really think of anybody else off the top of my head. I can't think of any other British actors that I could see in that role, but then again, if you had asked me before... Casino Royale, I wouldn't have been able to pull Daniel Craig from a list either. So, you know, that shows what I know. <laughs> and I, I think that's that's a key thing. It's that, of course, you never know. It, there's always somebody who's going to be completely off your radar, and that's usually the person they're going to grab and going to knock your socks off. Like, Sean Connery was just some Scottish muscle man, like, like we discussed in our original Dr. No discussion. Mm-hmm. Casting Sean Connery as James Bond was like casting a young Sylvester Stallone in an equivalent role, you know, pre-Rocky. It just wouldn't have made much sense. And yet here we have the guy who I'm assuming much of our audience probably put at number one. That's just my psychic powers going. (laughs) I would not be surprised at all because so many people just assume Connery is Bond. And there's so many people who won't let anything else get in the way of that thought, even if there's proof in the form of Daniel Craig and other and other actors that it can be done better. Not saying that he was bad. I mean, like, you know, I put him as number three, so he's in the top half, you know, above the top half line of my, my list in Bond characters, and he's right in the middle on my favorites. So there's still, but I still say there's better and worse. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people are going to be of that mind set that Connery is Bond. And they're not wrong, because as we mentioned, in both of these lists, it's very much subjective, because there have been so many different versions of Bond put out there, even officially. So Ian Fleming's literary character and the official Eon Films 
there have been so many different versions of the character that the ideal of who James Bond is, our whole point of discussion, is up for grabs. So that part of the list, subjective. Our personal favorites who we're entertained by, subjective. And as I noted, even Roger Moore himself says, yeah, it's Sean Connery. (laughs) So you're not wrong, people. I just don't happen to agree with you. And that's totally cool. Now, in terms of the question I posed a moment ago to you, it's interesting you said Benedict Cumberbatch, because out of name actors I can think of, assuming the timeline that we discussed with how long has Daniel Craig got left, Mm -hmm. I think by the time he's ready to say enough, Benedict Cumberbatch will have reached the ideal age to start playing James Bond. He's definitely got the acting chops for it. Um, Just... It might be hard to separate him from his role as Sherlock. I mean, it was even hard for me to separate him from his role as Sherlock just watching Star Trek. Um, but luckily, he's such a great actor that he was able to, to pull it off. So I, I guess, you know, it would be up to him well, to do it. If you think back, and this is something that people now forget, Roger Moore was Simon Templer, the saint, for years before he became 007. And that was a major thing when he started. Nobody remembers that anymore, but back then it was a big... So you can move on from a famous starring role, and even a famous starring role in the same genre, and make it work. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's entirely possible. being Bond, so... Now, going back further, if we're talking somewhere in late 80s, early 90s, or even mid-80s, Sean Bean... I think would have been a very interesting choice. Well, he did pull off a good 006, so um, I, I could see him. I mean, the, the fact that he pulled off a good 00 agent at all means he probably could have also pulled off the Bond role. You know, he definitely had that to begin with. So <clears throat> I could I could see that. Of course, then if you know if he was in the movie, they'd have to kill him. So that, we don't want him cast as Bond. <laughs> Because so you, nothing but well, hey, he could play Skyfall. There you go. <laughs> well, is Skyfall been made earlier? <laughs> oh yeah, <It's> just. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I can't think of anybody else off the top of my head that I. And again, obviously, no name actors. I'm not going to know their names, so it's possible. It's very possible that there's people out there that I'm just not thinking of right now. Now, other other actors who have been considered, um, we're throwing all the Americans out. So, um, James Brolin, no, forget it. Uh-uh, bye-bye. Michael Billington um, was a name that was bandied about a few times. He actually ended up being the Russian agent who Bond kills at the beginning of Spy Who Loved Me, okay. Anya's lover. Um, he, he had been up for the role a few times. I can't say whether he would have done well or not, because, again, he's one of those names who would have come totally out of the blue for me. Might I have been able to accept him? I don't know. But what, I, what I've what i seen, it doesn't seem right. But, again, you never know. Um, another actor who some people discuss a lot, even though he was never actually considered for the role, um, Patrick McGowan, who had played um, the lead character on what the Brits call Danger Man and what Americans call Secret Agent. And then he also played a 007-type character in The Prisoner, except one who had, of course, been outlived his usefulness. Um, I don't think he would have been right at all, and I don't think he would have even wanted the part, especially knowing some personal details. Like, he would not have been able to hand bond, handle Bond sexually. Um, when he worked on the movie Scanners with um, Cronenberg, he actually belittled the lead actress for having been married five times, called her a slut because she slept around, in his opinion, which I found actually rather disturbing. Didn't want to know that about him. <laughs> um, what a joke. Uh, but I, I've enjoyed his I've enjoyed his professional work, but I don't think he could have possibly played Bond. And then another name that was bandied about for a while, and I don't think ever seriously considered. And again, he fails on the same thing that one of the th- same things that Lazenby failed on was Mel Gibson. Um, no, <laughs> <laughs> well, like, that I honestly can't see working. No, but well, I mean. No, because early in his career, he I loved him in The Lethal Weapons. Um, I thought he was fantastic for that role because he was just this young, kind of crazy guy, who, and it pulled off very well. But that's not Bond. That's, you know, it worked great for that character, 
but it's not Bond. So I, can, I, I definitely wouldn't want to see, and especially now, I definitely wouldn't want to see him. I mean, though, he might fit the literary character better but with the racism and all. But uh, <laughs> Well, it, that's something I'm trying not to think of in terms of somebody's <laughs> personal life, because if, as we've discussed, if you have to do that, we're going to hate a lot of people. Yeah. Well, and I, I so, have no problem being able to say, oh, I like this person's work, although from what I've under, you know, I, I don't know him personally, but from what I've heard, and he's a jerk. Okay. I I love uh, Bruce Willis's acting. I love his stuff. I love the Die Hard movies. I like almost everything I've seen Bruce Willis in. I've heard he's a giant jerk and a pain in the butt to work with. But you know what? I don't got to work with him. I just got to watch his movies. So I have no problem watching his movies even knowing that. And that that was actually one thing I enjoyed very recently. Um, and this does have a Bond connection, actually. Um, I went and saw Machete Kills, uh, Rodriguez's new movie. And it was just so nice to be able to enjoy Mel Gibson in a movie again. I mean, there was no, none of the baggage was there. He was just out having fun again. And, you know, the standard Robert Rodriguez school of rehabilitating actors, he did the same thing for Charlie Sheen in this movie. Um, it worked out very well. And bonus for Bond fans... It's a parody of Moonraker. <laughs> Seriously. That's what this movie is, is it's a parody of Moonraker. Very interesting. So if you're into just absolutely insane, uh, don't take it seriously. If you're offended by anything, don't bother. But if you're up for letting go insane ball to the, balls to the walls action with some comedy, Machete Kills is interesting. Um, and for Bond fans, you have... The general framework of the plot is taken from the first two thirds of Moonraker. Nice. So, but in terms of other people I could picture playing Bond, none come to mind really. Yeah, and I think it has to do with the fact that first of all, <clears throat> I'm not you know that brushed up on my British actors, other than the ones that I have seen in roles that have transcended and and come to the United States as far as uh, you know things that we've heard of. There's a whole lot of shows and movies and stuff over there that uh, I've never heard of. You know, and maybe some of them are good, maybe some of the actors are great, but I don't know about them, so <laughs> I got no idea. But it is possible that that's uh, that's something going on. And I also think that a lot of it is we have been given such vivid portrayals and vivid images of who Bond is that until another one shows up, we're just so hung up on the ones we've already seen because they've made such an indelible impression. Like the top six of our list, we enjoy them all in some way or another. And we, like I said, we both agree that George Lazenby just shouldn't have been there. But as far as the top six, they're all perfectly enjoyable. So, and they make a huge impression on us. And I think that's another essence of this character is no matter what, he's going to stick with you. And I also find it interesting that a character whom on the surface, someone might think that people who would consider themselves to be feminists would absolutely hate Actually, most feminists I know love the James Bond movies. <laughs> <laughs> so it, he crosses over a lot of barriers that you wouldn't think. Just that's the power of this character. It's just the power to spark the imagination and to entertain and just to make you escape and enjoy for a while. Because that's the other thing Bond does is he helps us escape. It's like Total Recall. Okay, we all have our day-to-day -day lives. What would we really like to be? If we could do anything, secret agent. Okay, here's our secret agent fantasy. We're getting our ass to Mars or Britain or, you know, whatever exotic location. Because that was one of the things that Cobby Broccoli wanted to make sure of was we're, we're visiting all these locations in the world that most of us are probably never going to see. Mm -hmm. So Bond is a character we live vicariously through. We want to go on these adventures. We want to be the hero. And we either want to be this tall, dark, handsome stranger, or we want to beat this tall, dark, handsome stranger. Whichever. So it he's very much our escape. And I think more than most characters who have existed in cinema or in literature, Bond exemplifies that. Because there are others who really, really stand out as strong characters. Like, for example, Dracula who I mentioned earlier, uh -huh. but how many people want to escape to Dracula's world, really? How many people want to be Dracula, really? I mean, Well, there's whole yeah. groups of people you, that are you, devoted got, to that, got, but it's not a mainstream I mean, thing. <laughs> 
And, and that's where I'm getting, I mean, yes, you have subcultures, and you'll have subcultures for any type of character I could possibly name. Uh. I mean, you could have that for Teletubbies, Care Bears, that kind of thing. But in terms of just overall universal appeal, cross-culture, cross-border, cross-language, cross-gender, cross-orientation, James Bond is an ultimate escape. And I think that's part of why he's survived for over a half a century and still going strong. Absolutely. No, I completely agree. It's one of those things that's it's kind of universal. It doesn't matter what country you grew up in, doesn't matter what uh, you know, <clears throat> what economic class you grew up in. Being a secret agent is one of those fantasies. It ranks right up there with, you know, flying fighter jets or uh winning the lottery or, you know, being a famous actor or actress or something like that. It it, it ranks right up there as, as a common popular fantasy. So of course, movies based on that are going to be popular, and especially when they're done so well as most of the Bond movies are. Yeah, and I found that this particular character, even in his basest form, has grabbed me more than any other character of this archetype I've ever read. I mean, I'll be honest, I read Ludlum's first two books. I barely finished the second one. I can't stand reading Jason Bourne books. I just, (laughs) I don't like them at all. And I watched the first film and I was not nearly as impressed as everyone else I know is, including you, I think. (laughs) No, I'm actually a fairly big Ludlum fan. I was very, uh, I I read, honestly, actually the Bourne series was one of the last ones I read because I had seen the movies and I didn't want to ruin that image, but I read a bunch of his other ones because he wrote it. He was a very prolific author. I mean, there was a ton of stuff he wrote. Uh, The only ones where they lost me was after he died and other people started writing his characters. So it was Robert Lublin's something something written by Joe Schmo and those ones Eric Van Lusbader did most of them yeah I, and those ones I did not like as much but um, as far as Ludlum's actual work I really enjoyed them now I'm not saying they're literary masterpieces they're not uh, high end literature they're not uh, Catcher in the Rye or any of that they are fun quick spy spy thriller reads and I, I kind of group them in the same category as uh Tom Clancy books. I don't think of Tom Clancy books as high-end literature either, but I love reading them. They're just fun. Well, now, for me, once you get to Tom Clancy, his first four or five books are really, really good in terms of I enjoy reading them, even though I think he gets a little bit too dense in the, I'm a military encyclopedia, and I can frickin' prove it. (laughs) Um, In fact, I'm going to backtrack there and say that actually Red Storm Rising got a little bit too dense for me. Um, But And I say this as somebody who loves Frank Herbert's Dune books, so it's not that I can't read them. (laughs) Um, But, like, Hunt for October, great. Cardinal the Kremlin, great. Patriot Games, really good. Clear and Present Danger, really good. Then they started going downhill for me once Jack Ryan starts entering political office. It really jumps the shark. And then when it gets to Tom Clancy sold his name and didn't tell anybody and tried to put out some books that were ghostwritten and he didn't admit it at first, forget it. But even then, even when I was enjoying the Jack Ryan books, the char- and I liked the character, it still wasn't the same attraction in terms of enjoyment as a reader that James Bond has always been. Yeah, that, that's definitely true. I mean, like I said, I like those books. I've always been a fan of quick, easy, action thriller type reads. Um, I like to sprinkle those in. I don't want to just read just those, but I do like to sprinkle those in, especially when I'm reading other things that uh, are a little bit heavier, um, you know, or more, you know, what, what people would consider more literary, I suppose. But um, I do really enjoy those. I mean, I, I like to throw a little cheap mystery novel in there as well, you know, just something something to read and not have to use too much brain power on. Um, and that's where I think Ludlum and Clancy and all that kind of fit into the spectrum for me. They're not something I'm going to have to think about for a long time. It's just something that I can read and enjoy and then be done with it when I'm done with it. And speaking of literature, as a preview for our listeners out there, we're going to be segueing this discussion into our next episode, where we're going to be talking about some of the other writers 
who have written the character of James Bond. We're going to, in our next episode, be discussing the latest James Bond novel that just came out by William Boyd, Solo. We're also going to be looking at another recent book that came out just before that by Jeffrey Deaver, Carte Blanche. And we're going to look into James Bond as interpreted by John Gardner throughout the 80s. And we may be getting to some more as well, but definitely those three books. So we'll be continuing this discussion of who is James Bond and what have other people done with them, and do we think those books exemplify Bond? Um, so you can look forward to that in our next episode of on Her, of Her Majesty's Secret Podcast. But for this episode, is there anything else you wanted to say? Uh, no, I think we, we covered everything. We covered our lists. Um, oh, one last time, if you want to get a hold of us and tell us how wrong we are, uh, you can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Her Majesty's Pod. You can follow us on Twitter, please do, at Her Majesty's Pod. And of course, visit our website at hermajestyspod.com. Um, we are accessible. Come find us. Send us send us your messages. Tell us how wrong we are so we can tell you how wrong you are to think we are wrong or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> that makes sense, right? Sure it does. Sure. And you can also, again, find me on Twitter at CinemaOTR. You can also email me, Ziggy, at CinemaOnTheRocks.com. And if you would like to visit my site, I am at CinemaOnTheRocks.com, where you'll see reviews of many of the James Bond movies and lots of other movies and web series and short films. Yes, and uh, don't forget to check out all the other great shows and podcasts available right here on the Four Eyed Radio Network at FourEyedRadio.com. But that's going to do it for this episode of Her Majesty's Secret Podcast. I'm Ziggy Berkeley. And I'm Eric Dewey. And we will see you next time, only on The Fern. This has been another great presentation by the Four Eyed Radio Network. You can find more information at FourEyedRadio.com.